is considered a low blood pressure in a neonate. When should we be treating those low blood pressures? And how should we be treating those low blood pressures? Which medications should we be choosing? Hi, I'm Dr. Tala, and I've been a neonatologist for about 16 years now. I'm also post-call today, so bear with me a little bit. But for the next three videos, we're going to be discussing blood pressures, or more specifically, hypotension in the NICU. There are so many questions about neonatal hypertension. And in the next couple of videos, we're going to go over the myths that we all kind of perpetrate in the NICU. In part three of this series, we're going to be discussing different clinical approaches to different types of hypertension, if you will. Before I go on, I just want to say I used so many resources for these videos, but I kept coming back to these two papers by Dr. Geisinger and Dr. Malali. I've put the references below. They are excellent review articles on neonatal hypertension. Let's get started with myth number one. So the first myth is that we can use the terms vasopressin and inotropes interchangeably because they basically mean the same thing. Okay, I'm starting here because it really sums up how we've been treating blood pressure management up until recently. That a low blood pressure in one baby is the same thing as a low blood pressure in another baby and we should give them the same medication and so we might as well call all the medications the same thing. And we'll talk about this a lot more in the coming two videos, but we're realizing that really none of that is true. And all these different blood pressure medications, if you will, work in a slightly different way. So ideally, we need to pick exactly the right medication for a specific scenario. So a lot of the time when we're using the terms vasopressin and inotropes interchangeably, then we're just flat out wrong. They don't work the same way. And it also kind of glosses over that we don't really understand what's going on with the baby if we're using these terms in the same way. So let's go over these definitions. An inotrope is a medication that causes the heart to squeeze harder or it increases the contractility of the heart. Remember this by thinking inotropes make the heart go in and out, in and out, inotrope, in and out. <laughs> Help me anyway. These are medications like epinephrine, dobutamine, and milrinone, and they will all generally cause an increase in systolic blood pressure. Vasopressors, on the other hand, are medications that will squeeze the peripheral blood vessels. So literally vaso, vessel, presser, squeeze. And these are medications like norepinephrine, vasopressin, and dopamine. Generally, these medications, because they're squeezing the arterioles and the blood vessels in the periphery, are causing an increase in diastolic blood pressure. Another definition that we use is chronotropic drugs. So chronotropic, chrono, think like a watch, makes the heart rate go faster. So think, what medication are we, for example, using in the delivery room in a code to try to make the heart rate go faster? Yup, epinephrine. So epinephrine is also a chronotropic drug, as is, for example, dobutamine. It will make the heart beat faster. Two important things here that I'm sure you've figured out already, and that is that each individual drug may have more than one effect. For example, epinephrine is both a chronotrope, so makes the heart beat faster, and an inotrope, so makes the heart squeeze harder as well. And it's also possible that depending on the dose of the drug being given, then we're more likely to see one effect over the other. So for example, with dopamine, which everybody's used, we use it at different doses. And like you all know, at different doses, we expect it to be hitting more of one type of receptor. So we kind of expect it to be having slightly different effects depending on the dosage. And we'll be talking about that a lot more. And the second thing is, and this is like really the crux of these whole videos, is that we should be really figuring out why the baby has a low blood pressure and then treating with the right medication. For example, if a baby is septic and all the peripheral vessels are all dilated and the diastolic blood pressure is low, then we want to give a vasopressor to squeeze those vessels and increase the diastolic blood pressure. 
Or, for example, the baby had HIE and the heart took a hit as well and is not squeezing well, then in this scenario, what do we want? We definitely don't want a vasopressor. That will make the heart having to work even harder against the increased pressures. In this scenario, we would want an inotrope so that it will squeeze the heart better. So to rewrite myth number one, vasoactive agents are medications that affect a baby's blood pressure, and they include different classes of drugs, including inotropes, vasopressins, chronotropes. Myth number two, a blood pressure is a good indicator of the baby's oxygenation status. We can really get to the heart of this. Why do we care about a good blood pressure at all? Well, this is a question that we can answer. We care about a blood pressure because we're hoping that it will indicate adequate blood flow to make sure that all the cells in the body are getting the oxygen that they need. Or another more scientific way of saying it, we need adequate blood flow to make sure that we are getting end organ perfusion and maintaining cellular metabolism. So if the heart isn't pumping hard enough, or there's another reason why the blood isn't reaching all the cells in the body, then we're going to have a problem. The babies also don't get the oxygen they need if there literally isn't enough oxygen in the blood. So even if the heart is pumping really well and the blood pressure is fine, but for example, the baby is really anemic and isn't carrying enough oxygen, or for example, the baby has horrible pulmonary hypertension or respiratory distress, and the baby's SATs are in the 50s, and the blood just isn't carrying any oxygen, then again, those cells aren't going to get the oxygen that they need. So basically, to make sure that the cells, all the cells in the body, are receiving the oxygen they need for their cellular metabolism, we need two important things. We need sufficient cardiac output, which means that the heart is working well enough to distribute the blood to all the cells in the body, and we need sufficient oxygen within the blood as well. We'll be talking more about those terms, cardiac output and stuff, a little bit later. But for now, what I want you to understand is that what we do is we use blood pressure as a surrogate marker for how good the blood flow is to all the cells in the body. So what we're saying is if there is a good blood pressure, then we can assume that there is good perfusion of all the cells in the body. Again, we're using the blood pressure as a surrogate for blood flow, which brings us back to our myth. And as studies have shown, there is only a weak correlation between a baby's blood pressure and blood flow in the body. This is especially true in the first 24 hours of life or immediately after delivery. And for anybody that's interested, this study was done by measuring the blood flow in the superior vena cava or kind of measuring the amount of blood flow that is coming back to the heart and then correlating that with the blood pressure. So what this means is we could have a normal blood pressure, but in reality, there's a really low blood flow or we could have a low blood pressure, but really we have enough blood flow to all the cells in the body. Little caveat here. Obviously, if a baby's blood pressure is super low, like it's in the teens and like a 35 weeker, then at that point, the chances of having adequate blood flow is basically zero. So if it's really, really low, then yes, we're not going to have good blood flow, which again brings us back to our myth. So just because there is a low blood pressure, it doesn't mean we have a low blood flow. So what we need to do is look for other markers of low blood flow in addition to the blood pressure. So what are the markers? Well, let's start with if the baby is pale and has poor perfusion. So think about it, if the baby doesn't have enough blood going to all the cells in the body, it's definitely going to try to shunt that blood towards essential organs, so towards the heart and the brain. The skin isn't really an essential organ, so less blood will be going to the skin and so the baby will appear pale and there'll be decreased perfusion. So you'll have a delayed capillary refill. So like a three to four second cap refill time. Also, the kidneys aren't essential for second to second survival. So again, the blood would also be diverted away from the kidneys. And how would you know that this is happening? Because there would be decreased urine output. Objectively, decreased urine output would be considered less than one ml per kilo per hour, 
But really what's more important is how much the baby is urinating now compared to how much it was urinating previously. So if the baby was peeing like four mLs per kilo per hour and is now peeing 1.1, then that's a huge drop off in urine output. Then ultimately, if the cells in the different organs aren't receiving the oxygen they need, then how are those cells going to metabolize? Yep, anaerobically. And what do the cells produce when they metabolize anaerobically? Lactic acid. So seeing an increase in lactic acid is also further proof that all the cells in the body aren't getting the oxygen they receive. So for example, if you measure the lactic acid and it's above two or above between two to four millimoles per liter, then this is a sign of the cells receiving inadequate oxygen. If you're not measuring the lactic acid, then this could also be shown by an increase in metabolic acidosis on the gases. I know you know that, I'm just saying it. Let's reword that myth. Blood pressure may be one indicator of the baby's oxygenation status. Other indicators would be whether the baby is pale, does the baby have delayed perfusion, so a delayed cap refill, has the baby's urine output dropped off, and do we have increased lactic acidosis or an increasing metabolic acidosis. Myth number three, the mean blood pressure is the most important indicator of overall status. Now, I know that you know that this isn't true because otherwise, why would we be even measuring or kind of figuring out the systolic and the diastolic blood pressures and then documenting them? Remember, the mean blood pressure is exactly what it sounds like. It's the average blood pressure that the baby is experiencing. So basically, it's the average between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressures. In adults, because our heart beats slower, we spend a lot longer in diastole than systole. So the average blood pressure in adults is closer to the diastolic blood pressure. In babies whose heart rates beat a lot faster, their mean blood pressure is relatively closer to their systolic blood pressure. The reason why we talk about mean blood pressure so much, and I think there are probably two reasons here. The first is, is that when we are doing non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, the mean blood pressure is what's actually really being measured. And then the other systolic and diastolic are kind of being figured out. So if anything, the mean blood pressure is probably a slightly more accurate reading. And the other big reason is that we all often use the mean blood pressure as kind of an acceptable blood pressure for premature infants. So I learned this and I actually teach it to people as a pretty good starting point if you're really concerned about the blood pressure. And that is that the mean blood pressure should be about the gestational age of the baby. So for example, if the baby is born at 30 weeks and we have a mean blood pressure of 31, then hopefully that's okay. By the way, this number came from the German neonatal network where they looked at about 5,000 babies who were less than 32 weeks. And they found that if they teased out the numbers, that if in the first 24 hours of life, the mean blood pressure of the baby was less than the baby's gestational age in weeks, then that baby had an increased risk for IVH, BPD, and death. And so mean blood pressure became kind of like a catchy thing to remember in the unit. Oh, it has to be the gestational age. Not only that, but we kind of extrapolated it. So we have a four week old X32 weeker. Okay, the mean blood pressure should be 36. But as you would all suspect, the mean blood pressure doesn't tell the full story about whether the baby is getting adequate blood flow. It might be a good starting point, but it doesn't tell the full story. And I can give you all an example that you've all seen so many times. So let's assume that you have a two week old X25 week infant with a mean blood pressure of 28. But when you look at the systolic and the diastolic, the systolic is 40 and the diastolic is 17. The mean is okay, but what do you think about the actual systolic and the diastolic or the pulse pressure. That diastolic definitely sounds low, but let's figure out the pulse pressure and how do we figure out whether it's wide or not. So what we do is we double the diastolic, so 17 times two is 34. If the double the diastolic is still less than the systolic, then we consider this a widened pulse pressure. So in this situation, 34 is obviously less than 40. We do have a widened pulse pressure and it looks very much like we have a very low diastolic blood pressure. In this baby, you may listen to the heart and hear a really loud murmur. 
So this would all go with a PDA. Now, with a PDA or a symptomatic PDA, you might have adequate pumping from the left ventricle, but a lot of that blood may get shunted off during diastole. So even though the mean blood pressure is adequate, there might not be enough blood actually getting to the body. So you might see decrease in urine output or increasing acidosis because of a PDA. And we've all had these scenarios before in the NICU. Let's cover another example. And this is directly from Dr. El Khufash's paper. So let's say that you have a 30 week baby with a mean blood pressure of 30. Again, maybe that appears acceptable, but then let's assume that the systolic blood pressure is 32 and the diastolic blood pressure is 25. If anything, this pulse pressure is narrow. The diastolic blood pressure is pretty high and the systolic blood pressure is pretty low. What does this mean? This suggests that the heart is trying to squeeze against higher pressures and most likely with that low systolic, the heart isn't able to create the cardiac output that it needs to. So if the heart isn't get, getting enough cardiac output, then the cells in the body are probably not getting the oxygen that they need. So even though the mean blood pressure appears adequate here, it looks like the heart isn't being able to pump adequately. So let's reword that myth. The mean blood pressure may be one indicator of adequate blood flow going to the baby's body, but the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure also may give you clues about why that baby is not getting enough blood flow. Myth number four, routinely treating low blood pressures in neonates improves outcomes. And this is the key part of everything we do, right? Like why even measure something and treat it if it's not going to make any difference in the outcome? So to take an example completely out of context, say we measure the thyroid level in a baby and we find out that it's low. And so we give thyroid medications. If giving thyroid medications doesn't really affect how the baby does in the future, we wouldn't even bother giving thyroid medications. We wouldn't even bother testing the thyroid because it doesn't make any difference. So this is how we should think about all of medicine. If we find the low blood pressures and we do something about it, does it actually make a difference? We know from historical studies that having a very low blood pressure is not good for outcomes. So it increases the risk of IVH as well as bad neurodevelopmental outcomes in the future, having very low blood pressures in babies. But the question still remains, if the babies do have low blood pressure, whatever we end up calling that, and we treat the low blood pressure, do those babies end up doing better? Well, you can imagine how hard this study is to do. If you're doing it retrospectively, so you're looking back at charts of babies that were treated with blood pressure medications, then you would assume that the babies that ended up getting the blood pressure medications versus those that didn't were kind of sicker anyway, so they were more predisposed to have bad outcomes anyway. So that's very difficult to tease out whether actually treating the low blood pressures helped or not. And then obviously doing that study prospectively would be very difficult too. So say you had a huge group of premature babies and then you randomize them to either receive blood pressure medication for low blood pressures or not to receive medication. You can imagine all the hoops that you'd have to jump through and also that would be very difficult as the clinician taking care of the baby when we've so been trained that low blood pressures is bad, we'd like find it really hard not to actually act on that. So a very difficult study to do. Well, amazingly, a large group of researchers as part of the hypertension in premature infants or HIP trial actually did manage to start this study. They enrolled infants less than 28 weeks and they defined a low blood pressure, like we've been talking about, as a blood pressure lower than the gestational age. If the babies did have low blood pressure, then they were randomized into two different groups. So in one group, the babies were given a fluid bolus, 10 mLs per kilo, and then started on dopamine. And in the other group, they were given a fluid bolus and then started on the placebo, which was D5W. And this was all blinded. So the providers didn't know if the babies were getting dopamine or D5W. This graph shows the baby's blood pressures. And you can see that the babies that actually received dopamine did have slightly higher blood pressures. 
which is nice, at least dopamine works, I guess you can say. The primary outcome of the study was survival without severe brain injury on ultrasound. And this was actually slightly more common in the placebo group, so 69% versus in the dopamine group, 62%. Mortality was the same in the two groups, as was BPD, neck, and PVL. So if you just look at this data, you might be thinking, well, maybe we shouldn't really be starting dopamine at all in these babies with low blood pressures. Unfortunately, though, this study was very underpowered, and they only ended up recruiting about 8% of the babies that they wanted to for lots and lots of reasons, but really because there aren't that many preterm babies and they required that the preemie babies all had invasive blood pressure monitoring as well. So it was very difficult to recruit babies. Also, there were a lot of babies that if they did end up showing signs of decreased perfusion, so for example, if they had a lactate of more than four, then the clinicians could go ahead and use other blood pressure medications to try to improve those babies' blood flow. So there was kind of a bit of crossover between these two groups anyway, because a lot of the babies in the placebo group did receive extra medications for or their blood pressures. So let's reword that myth. Treating a low blood pressure when it's been shown that the cells have inadequate oxygen for metabolism, so for example with a high lactic acid or whatever, is more likely to affect outcome than when we just treat the blood pressure alone. That was really wordy. Right, that brings us to the end of our first four myths about blood pressure. If you have reached this far, then please like this video, tell us where you're watching from, and also will you tell us which vasoactive agents you use in your NICU? I just want to say one more time, thank you so much for being here.